Hey listeners, Mallory Wilsey here, chief producer of the Enrollify Network. I get the privilege of working alongside all of our creators at Enrollify, but I wanted to take just a quick moment to tell you about why I love the Talking Tactics podcast hosted by Diana Kibbolds. Every other Tuesday, Day drops a new episode where she focuses on a single tactic that moved the needle on any enrollment metric, from inquiries and booth visitors to apps completed and deposits, even registrations, you name it. The catch? The tactic had to be done with limited resources, either by a single person or a small but mighty team, or limited time, or maybe without a lot of money. The podcast format is fun and engaging, and it's just different from the more traditional 60-minute interview-style shows. If you work in enrollment management or marketing, be sure to give Day's show a listen. You can subscribe to the show by visiting podcast.enrollify.org or just search Talking Tactics wherever you get your podcasts. No, I don't want to find my future. So like if find your future is something you're saying, guess what? It's being said across 100,000 higher ed websites. Stop with the generic taglines and slogans. Hit it! That's what I'm talking about. Wait! Okay now, from the beginning. Hit it, boys. Welcome to Higher Ed Pulse, your Monday morning energizer covering insights and trends in higher ed marketing and enrollment. I'm Mallory Wilsey, bringing over 15 years of ed tech and marketing expertise to your earbuds. And I'm Seth O'Dell, joining the Pulse with my own adventures from leading marketing at top universities to founding Canahoma, one of the industry's fastest growing digital marketing agencies. Each week, we bring you the kind of insider insights you typically only find over cocktails with your pals at a conference. It's fast, it's fun, and it's designed for you, the busy higher ed professional. You're not just listening to another podcast. You're checking the pulse of higher education. Higher Ed Pulse is part of the Enrollify Network, a robust collection of podcasts designed to help higher ed professionals like you grow. Explore our other shows at enrollify.org. Enrollify is made possible by Element 451, the next generation AI student engagement platform, helping institutions create meaningful and personalized interactions with students. Learn more at element451.com. I hear you staycationed recently. Tell me more about it. I did. I am back from a trip, but I did not go far. And I am a full-on staycation convert. So my wife's family every summer rents a house in South Mission Beach in San Diego, uh, which is where I live. San Diego is obviously beautiful. The beaches are great. But the reality is you just don't go all that often. And so, like, they've been doing this for, like, no joke, 50 years, like, multiple generations. And I've been doing it, obviously, ever since I've been with my wife, Lauren. And it's one of my favorite highlights of the year. I think, like, if you don't slow down, sometimes you forget how beautiful things are in your own backyard. And so, like, this is my full-on endorsement. I'm going all in on promoting staycations. So like stamp of approval, big time, had a great week in San Diego where I already live, but it was so great to explore. Oh, that's amazing. I mean, summer is such a great time for that. I feel like, you know, I feel the same way about Saratoga. Like when people ask me, oh, where are you traveling to this summer? I'm like, nowhere. I live here because I live for Saratoga summers between our performing arts center and the track, which I've talked about on our podcast. Like There's just so much happening just in our backyard, like you said, and to be able to take advantage of it and for us to finally have some nice weather, you know, it's just like it it doesn't have to cost a lot to have a ton of fun. Totally. I love it. It's so good. Well, listen, on that highlight, I think it's time for us to dish because I am like really pumped for this week's topic. I don't know if you want to share a little bit about it, where it came from, but like I am fired up for this week's episode. So not only last week was I like, hey, maybe we should do a pet peeves episode. I uh, went back to that LinkedIn post that I referenced a few times where we just got scores of great ideas for episode content. And Dustin Ramsdell, who hosts the Higher Ed Geek on Enrollify, actually responded to that post and was like, you guys need to talk about your biggest pet peeves when it comes to higher ed marketing. And so I think all the stars aligned and... I don't know. Like I came with a list of like 30 pet peeves. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> That's awesome. I have, I have mine broken out into five categories, but there are a few underneath each. We're going to have, maybe we'll do some rapid fire. And I will say for folks listening, I have no idea what's on Mallory's list and she does not know mine. So this should hopefully be fun. I'm super curious what your marketing pet peeves are. Uh, like, where do you want to start? How do you want to unpack this? 
I I mean, where do you start? I, I'm kind of I I admire you, Seth, for providing a framework of five categories for your pet peeves. So I'm like kind of dying to know what the first category is. And maybe I'll slot my pet peeves into your categories. How is that? You got it perfect. So first one is website related. So it's the category is websites. And it's a very simple one. It's got only one bullet on it. It's probably one of my biggest ones. It's .edu websites that are designed to serve all audiences because they're just not. Like current students and faculty and staff should be on intranets or they should be supported in other forms and other capacities, other avenues. The website is a marketing tool. It is designed to serve prospective students, maybe the general public at large. It is unequivocally not designed to serve your entire community. And I don't know how and why and where that became this expectation that the web serves all people. So all audience websites is possibly my number one pet peeve because it's just not theoretically or like philosophically correct. And it's not correct from an economic perspective. It's a huge missed opportunity. So all audience websites is number one. Mm, cosign. I think that we try to do way too much with our websites, and this has been the conversation for 15 years. So why haven't we fixed this yet? Like, why can't we just make a choice, right? Websites are for prospective students and the media. Like, that's it. Like, current students, send them somewhere else. Faculty members, print out a piece of paper. I don't know. Like, like I, I am with you. So under the category of websites, I'm going to add slow load time. Why? Like Ooh. it's 2024 folks. Come, come on. Like I can use AI to, to like do literally anything I want it to do. And your .edu still takes two and a half, three seconds to load. On my I device. totally agree. Like, and that's being generous. <laughs> like it's, it's just, it's so frustrating. And it has, like our friend Joel Goodman talks about this all the time. It has a significant impact on conversions and, you know, how deep people are getting into the website and their wayfinding. And sorry, I'm going to go off on one more thing. The fact that we make people find information on websites is another pet peeve of mine. Where else in life do we make people find information? It just comes to us when we want it, right? And one of the simplest ways to address that is like how bad click path is, which is just like, what are the actions you want to take and just count the clicks. And it's like, it's a little rudimentary, but like nine times out of 10, it just shows you, if someone's got to click seven or eight times to get the information they want, like maybe, maybe you should put that a little bit further towards the front and make it a little bit easier to find. Yeah. It's so reactive when we are in a world that's surrounded by technology that gives us proactive choices all the time. All right. Can I hit my second big one? I, I have some more in the weeds, but my second, my second one is taglines and slogans. Look, I will I will say there's rare exceptions to this and I want to caveat that, that like sure could you but like no, I don't want to find my future. So like if find your future is something you're saying, guess what? It's being said across a hundred thousand higher ed websites. Stop with the generic taglines and slogans. So my biggest piece of advice is just take that term and search for it and search, go to Google, type search colon dot edu, and it'll search only dot edu websites. And you'll realize that that unique slogan for your grad program is being shared by everybody else. So I don't want to find my future. I don't want to find anything else. I don't want to pursue my passion. Like I like, please either stop with taglines or slogans, which nine times out of 10 is what you should do. They don't serve any purpose. and They take up real estate or make sure the one that you have is truly unique to you as an institution. So generic taglines and slogans is a big pet peeve of mine. It makes me so mad every time I see them. I'm going to admit that I was almost going to put this one on my list, but then I felt like it was a cop out. I'm not going to lie, Seth. Like, you're not the first person to say that. And I think we've all been saying it. But again, nothing is being done about it. And but Seth, we're all special snowflakes, right? So when you're finding your future or pursuing your passion at my institution, you know, like it's, but it's different than the one down the street. Come on. Anybody else it's not, and uh, not to the rest of the world. And so, yeah, I think it's time people got to shake it up a little bit and just free up the real estate. How about instead of saying your, like your fancy slogan, just say like, you know, 50 plus programs on campus online, like give people value props, like, because there's like, people don't know enough about your product. And so like, I think people don't do straight man creative nearly enough, which is just like, you know, insert city's name leader in X education. Like, okay, cool. Got it. Now at least I have some context for who you are. Uh, so yeah. Okay. What, what's, the, what's the next on your list? Well, related to this, or I'm going to just keep building off of yours here. It's like, it's the comparisons that don't make any sense. It's when the 
you know, the institution that is very localized and serving a very specific population keeps looking at your Ivy League marketing or whatever and is like, well, we want to be like MIT or we, we want to be like Harvard and they're oh, doing yeah. it this way. So we should do it this way, too. We're the heart. We're the heart of Harvard of Southern Montana. It's like, what? <laughs> like, what? Right. Yeah. Like, just stop. Like, it, it's, it goes back to differentiation, right? Which I think is the point of this category. Like, be differentiated. Don't just copy what everyone else is doing. And don't just try to be like some very aspirant institution because they are the Ivy League that everyone talks about. Like, carve your path because your audience and your students are not Harvard students or Yale students, etc. Totally. And when you do have unique things to say, I think also another list, figure out how to say them. So another pet peeve of mine, this is going down a list, but just riffing with you. I always hate when people say their actual rank. If you are not literally ranked first in something, you should never say we're 18th because all you're saying is the 18th best regional whatever is telling me that there's 17 people better than you. And so if you're not number one, you always want to say top and then round up to the next number. So if you're 18th, you want to say top 20. We're a top 20 school. Oh, what? They don't know which number. You could be one, you could be 20. Don't highlight the fact that 17 people got you beat and that maybe they should go look them up instead. So if you do have differentiation you know, and points that you can position on, maybe do it in a way that helps you. So drop your specific ranking unless you're number one and just round up and do top blank and the thing can be better off. There's real behavioral economics baked into what you just said. Like there, re it really is. Like it's in Melina Palmer's book to not do stuff like that. And she was... Our Engage Summit keynote, I talk about her all the time because she writes good books and everybody needs to go read them. Melina has an example in one of her books uh, where she walked by a nail salon and it said like the number one nail salon in you know Houston in 2016. And she's like, it's 2024. Yeah, you know? What happened? Like, what happened? So in her example, right, it's just say you were number one ranked nail salon in Houston. You don't need to qualify it with the year, right? So it's the exact same thing. You don't need to say you're, you've got 17 people who beat you in your program. Like just say top 20 and let people make their own decisions. I totally agree. Uh, all right, next on my list, I'm going to try to cluster is like content misses, I would say. And so there's a few of those. I'm mostly thinking in the lens of advertising. The first is a lack of video content. You know, video performs demonstrably better across paid shit social from an acquisition perspective, yet most people don't do it. So lack of video content. The second is obviously the number one, which is students under trees, like generic campus imagery. But the third is using the same stock photography as your competitors. And so this is like a simple tip to all the marketers listening. Take the stock photo, download it, and do a reverse image search on Google and see who else is using it. This happens in particular in healthcare. We see it the most. But like people will literally be using the exact same photo for their program that their competitors are and so like one don't use stock if at all possible but if you have to try to make sure it's not one that other people are using so lack of video content students under trees and like you know replicating your competitors stock selection are also my biggest content misses that are pet peeves for me and related to this it's fake diversity right don't showcase your perfectly diverse friend group probably sitting under that tree on the home page if your campus is you know, made up of entirely one demographic. We hear that a lot in research, actually. That, like when we do research for some of our clients on the brand side, students will complain and they'll say like, like I thought that I was coming into a different place than I was. And you know, it's about like, you wanna celebrate all backgrounds but in a way that's authentic to your actual distribution and representation. So like, that's a really good one to call out. Yeah, it also ticks me off when I see institutions just slapping rainbow filters, you know, on their Pride Month logos or, or whatever. It's like uh, just putting like a rainbow behind your institution's logo does not mean that you actually support LGBTQ plus students like your wrath, right? So I want to see the receipts. I want to see the programs and the scholarships and, and how you are supporting these students. And I don't just want to see it in June. <laughs> Like I want to see it 12 months out of the year and then you can put the rainbow logo on and own it and feel good about it. I totally agree. I love it. What else you got? I got one more. I got one more in the content bucket. It's overusing the mascot. Unless you are a championship winning institution where you know your athletics program is driving significant enrollment, 
Far too many D2 and 3 institutions get caught up in overusing the mascot for either a, a replacement of their brand or for naming things on their campuses. And I'm going to call out my alma mater here because this is my pet peeve is like from when I was a student in undergrad and every freaking club or acronym for the new task force on campus because we also know higher ed loves committees and there's another pet peeve right there but it's you know everything was night this night that because we were the purple knights and guess who didn't care about the athletics at this school 90 percent of the student body like it was not a draw to going to that institution and the fact that it just got shoved down our throats like <laughs> For 20 years, I've been holding this in, Seth. That's good. I'm glad that we can finally like shed some light. I talk about my alma mater, but it doesn't exist anymore. So <laughs> there's no point in kicking that grade. Uh, they just closed last month. So RIP. Uh, that's a good one. All right, I got two more. I'm going to stick to my, I'm going to skip to the last and then back up because my, my, my last one is probably the biggest mic drop one. But so I'm just going to go for my kitchen sink. This category is kitchen sink. It's the one off didn't fit. So these are really random. Landing pages that don't match your search query. Like if you're gonna invest money in marketing in program specific paid search, drive someone to a program specific landing page. It's so cost inefficient to not do that. Like drive them to a page that's relevant to what they searched. It's so simple, but people don't do that. They market on an individual program and drive you to a landing page for the whole institution. Terrible. Number two is organic social content that isn't designed for your organic social audience. Meaning that's times they put marketing stuff on there or like, you know, promoting something for potential students. Potential students aren't connected to your social, current students and alumni are connected to your students. So like market to the majority of people that actually follow you right now, please. And then my third one, and I am a big failure at this. This is my fault. I'm like taking arrows in my own back. Airport advertising. Uh, look, sometimes it makes sense. I have done it for partners even in the past year, and I think we've done it well. And there's time, there are times where it works. So like every rule deserves to be broken. But by and large, if you're buying airport advertising just cause, it's almost always a bad idea. And so airport advertising as an overarching category gets a pet peeve for me with the caveat that I break this rule myself, but even still, I feel queasy when I do. <laughs> nice. My last one, and I'm going to invoke Melina Palmer one more time. She speaks uh, about the difference between quality brands and value brands. And depending on which you fall into, the way that you price matters. A value brand is going to use the 999 strategy. A quality brand is just going to call it $10, right? So there's some little nuances. And I, you know, again, go read her book. Like, it's great. But my point is quality brands, which I would say are many of our higher ed institutions, a quality brand should not be offering discounts, whether that's application fee waivers, or we've extended this deadline, or it's a last chance enroll, you'll get this much off your tuition, or et cetera, et cetera. Now, discounts are different from tuition assistance, right? Like I am not like just for the record, I am not saying that scholarships are a bad thing by any means, but it screams desperation. And I was sitting in a student panel at a conference a couple weeks ago and the student got the mic and she literally said almost that exact same thing she said i was down to you know my x y and z top choices and one of them continued to email her uh, because their crm wasn't great and apparently still had her in the bucket of you know uh, people who they didn't realize had already been accepted and she was getting all of these communications about extending deadlines and all of these last chance discount things. And she was like, it just had a very negative effect on her. She was like, wait a second. <laughs> like you didn't, you didn't honor the fact that I actually got my application stuff in on time. Like if you were just going to bump the, bump the deadline, like what, how does that make me feel? I did, I did what I was supposed to do, you know? And then she's seeing all these different discounts coming in. She's like, but I can't access any of them because I did what I was supposed to do on time. So it just screams desperation. And I hate that institutions are under pressure to have to do those types of things because it degrades the brand over time. And that just, it hurts my heart. It just, we shouldn't be doing it. We have to stop. Yeah, yeah, I like that. I think it's so often the sign of desperation, you're right. And I think it's a really, really good one. 
All right, I can hit my last pet peeve. My last pet peeve is not about marketing, it's about marketers. So, hold on everybody, I'm not trying to spit too much fire, Like, but my last pet peeve is complaining you can't win with the resources you have, and then not leaving. And what I mean by that is twofold. The first is, I've always been a believer in my career that you win with the team you have. It's so easy to say, oh, I can't be successful because I don't have enough resources, I don't have the team. So one, you have to figure out how to win with the cards you've been dealt and the resources that you do have. And two, if you truly believe you cannot win with the resources you have, then you need to leave. Like you need to quit your job and go work somewhere else. And I don't mean tomorrow, I totally understand it's a, it's a challenging market, uh, you know. What I mean is like over a long enough timeline, you need to leave. I, you can't stay at an institution and blame the institution and say you're not resourced to be successful and then stay there year after year after year. You either have to be the person that's gonna step in and try to win with the resources you have or say, Y'all are crazy, I'm out of here. And at some point when the stars align and make sense, you make a move. I would love to see more people quit and go to other institutions and trade up and shuffle around. You know, some of the best things, moves I've made in my career were both get, switching at UCLA from centralized to a grad school and then leaving UCLA, which I got laughed at for leaving, to go to a small online school, Southern New Hampshire, in 2011. It's like, you gotta make your bets and move around. So, complaining you can't win with the resources you have, but then not leaving is my final pet peeve. And I'm gonna like duck as I say that one because I love all of y'all. And like, and maybe you haven't said it, but I've heard it. And so I'm just like gonna like slyly shuffle and slide back and see if that one doesn't, you know, come boomerang back and hit me too hard. <laughs> Yeah, I, you know, I, that's a tough one. And I think there's always, right, 800 reasons why someone chooses to stay or to not leave or whatever. But yeah, it's like, you can't, you can't have both. You can't complain and not leave. You get, you got to either stop complaining and stick around. Yeah, that's, which is a very fair option, got. which is exactly, which is a super fair option, which is it's like, I'm just going to do my best to win with what I got. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, it's one or the other. So it's either like take the medicine or find a new doctor. Yeah. Well, hey, this is actually a nice little segue, Seth. Uh, you teamed me up and you didn't even know it. So last week, we announced a new Enrollify course. In fact, the first course that we have developed since we uh, took over the network about a year ago. So this course is called Lessons in Leadership. It is taught by Dr. Carrie Phillips. You'll probably remember her amazing Pulse Check series on this topic earlier in the year. And the course is designed for new leaders who are like you, who are emerging, but not getting the proper training to be successful. And, you know, we are here to change that. This course is going to prepare new and aspiring leaders to be more confident, empathetic, and effective. And Carrie is going to touch on things like systems thinking, adaptive leadership, uh, how to build a positive workplace culture, and yet how to still handle difficult decisions. Um, it's very comprehensive and it's all online and you can do it asynchronously. So don't wait, the course starts on September 9th and for a lucky group of 26 students, we have the option to add interactive sessions with Carrie for personalized guidance. So you can find out all the information on enrollify.org. I will also drop a link in the show notes and you can learn more. And if you have any questions, just reach out to me. I'd be happy to answer them. Love it. That's awesome. Well, so hope folks get to do that. And uh, in the meantime, thanks for everyone listening. Hopefully you, you still enjoy it. I guess my last thing I would call is like, if you have your own pet peeves, I'd love to see them on LinkedIn when we post this. I just would love to know if you disagree with ours or if you have your own. This was one of the most fun episodes we've done in a long time. So I really love the prompt. Uh, and I would love to hear what people have to say. Yes, thank you again, Dustin, for the prompt on this one. And you know Enrollify is going to be sharing the link out to this episode. And I just can't wait to see what people have to say with their biggest pet peeves. Do you, do you agree with me and Seth? Disagree? We'll take it. But we also want to hear, you know, what we missed. So find us on LinkedIn and let us know. All right. Thanks, everybody. Until next time. See you soon. Bye-bye. The Higher Ed Pulse is part of the Enrollify Podcast Network. If you like this podcast, chances are you'll like other Enrollify shows too. Our podcast network is growing by the month. 
And we've got a plethora of marketing, enrollment, and higher ed technology shows that are jam-packed with stories, ideas, and frameworks, all designed to empower you to be a better higher ed professional. Our show helps higher ed marketers and admission pros find their next big idea and features a selection of the industry's best as your hosts. Learn from Brian Gross, Eddie Francis, Jenny Lee Fowler, and so many of your favorite leaders in higher ed. Enrollify is made possible by Element 451, the next generation AI student engagement platform, helping institutions create meaningful and personalized interactions with students. Learn more at element451.com.